this was a recent exhibition at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. And Laura will highlight the artist inventor Rufus Porter's remarkable career, including his foundational main experiences. As senior consulting curator at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, Laura curated the exhibition with Justin Wolf, who is professor of art and history of art history at the University of Maine. Uh, a catalog, which you see the cover of, of the same name as the exhibit was published in 2019 by Penn State University Press. And this catalog is in our collection at the Scarborough Public Library if you'd like to borrow it. And Laura can tell you how to buy it if you would like to own it. A few housekeeping matters. Um, we're, we're recording tonight's program. There are several people who were unable to join us for the live talk who have requested the link to the recording. And so some questions have been submitted in advance, but we welcome your questions. And so to ask a question, please use the chat feature and send it to me, Lucy Norval. Um, we ask that you stay muted so everyone can hear Laura. And Laura, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. You're welcome. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you to the Scarborough Public Library for inviting me to speak this evening. I'm delighted to be here to share discoveries of a four-year research project into the career of Rufus Porter. The work, as Lucy said, culminated in an exhibition at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art that opened last year and Justin Wolf, the professor of art history at the University of Maine, my co-curator, and I edited the book. You see the co cover here, which features one of Rufus Porter's wonderful wall murals. Um, and if you're interested in purchasing it, a copy, the, um, you, can, you can find one through the Bowdoin College bookstore. So who was Rufus Porter and why should we care about him? An itinerant artist and inventor, a polymath, Porter was born in Boxford, Massachusetts in 1792, raised in Western Maine, and began his career in Portland in the 18 teens. He's known to people for many different things. He was a talented painter of wall murals and miniature portraits in examples you see here. He established a compelling publishing career in New York City founding the Scientific American in 1940, sorry, 1845, and the magazine is celebrating its 175th anniversary this year, and it's arguably Porter's greatest and most enduring legacy. Porter's real passion, however, was for invention and mechanical improvement, especially mechanized flight with his steam-powered traveling balloon an early dirigible-like aircraft, which you see at the bottom of the slide. He called it his aeroport, and the illustration here is from one of his newspapers. His effort to build a prototype reached its peak in the early 1850s, but after the project failed, Porter receded into obscurity. He died unheralded in New Haven, Connecticut in 1882, and his West Haven grave site can no longer be identified. Not until the 20th century did he emerge from the shadows, thanks to research in the 1920s by two American wall painting scholars, and then between 1950 and 1980 with books by the arts editor, Jean Lippmann. A re-examination of, of the life of this remarkable artist inventor was long overdue. Justin Wolf and I were able to document Rufus Porter's life and interests in antebellum America and help to put him in his rightful place as a major American figure in art, technology, and communication. We also gained a deeper understanding of how his upbringing in Maine influenced his interests and his development. Over 20 institutions and private collectors, including the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, Library of Congress, Maine Historical Society, and the National Portrait Gallery supported our research. Their paintings, prints, and objects help tell Porter's story. They illustrate the book, and you'll see some of them in this presentation. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our research. 
Rufus Porter proved to be an ambitious and often daunting subject. Only a handful of his letters are known and his peripatetic life makes him difficult to track in period sources. Unpublished materials such as personal papers, account books, or editorial correspondence from his newspaper career, which we had hoped to find, are either lost or still buried deep in an archive. Moreover, early in his adult life, Rufus Porter was one of three men of that name living in Southern Maine, and their interests and activities sometimes converged. Fortunately, Porter's whereabouts and activities can be reliably traced in primary sources, including vital and town records, censuses, deeds, newspapers, and city directories. Our efforts were bolstered by Julie Lindbergh, who generously shared her amazing collection of Porter materials and patiently answered our steady round of questions. In the study of Porter's miniature portraits, art historian Deborah Child contributed her research as chapter two of the book. In her search for watercolor portraits that can be confidently attributed to Porter, because he didn't sign his work, she identified over 120 examples of which 85 bear inscriptions identifying the sitters. These documented examples are critical to understanding how and where Porter worked and the development of his style. You see two of his finest miniatures here that are in private collections. On the left is Sarah Warland Porter, not a direct relative. She's the wife of a was a wife of a tavern keeper in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She hosted many Harvard students at their tavern. This was painted in 1819, and it's one of only two known painted on costly ivory. And on the right, the 1825 double portrait of Jonathan Smith and his wife, Pamelia Moores of Chemsford, Massachusetts, painted on watercolor, in watercolor on paper. Porter always completed these works with frames, and here are two beautiful gilded examples. We mind Porter's specific material productions and his many published writings. He edited and published four scientific newspapers in New York City from 1840, including the Scientific American, which he founded in 1845. Porter's newspaper editorials are full of wonderful material and a number of other important sources were just waiting to be consulted. For example, we tracked down a complete run of Porter's Aerial Reporter, his newspaper from 1852 to 1854, detailing the construction of his traveling balloon. There were only, there were only two full complete sets of this newspaper that survived in American libraries. In 1983, Smithsonian curator Tom Crouch identified this rare periodical in his Eagle Aloft, Two Centuries of the Balloon in America, and he quoted Porter's autobiography. Running out of news about the airport, Porter filled the final issue of the Aerial Reporter with his quote, epitome of experience and practice. We were able to co cooperate many of the activities that Porter described, and it helped to prove, it proved to be a very valuable source. When considered in the context of his extensive work with collaborators, artisans, mechanics, engravers, printers, and many others, Porter's activities document how his multidisciplinary achievements contributed to art, invention, and innovation in early America. As much as we've learned, however, we've really only scratched the surface. We hope our efforts will provide a new foundation from which to launch continued scholarly investigation of this important American. We address Porter's art, invention, and publishing around major themes in his life, and it's still a good way to think about him. It begins in 1815 with his first documented activities in Maine, where he grew up, and ends with his quest to develop mechanized flight with his airport in the 1850s. Much of his life was based in Massachusetts. He grew up in Western Maine and his itinerancy roots wound through New England, depicted here by 
an early map at the Osher Map Library at the University of Southern Maine. By documenting his many diverse activities, we aim to place him in the broader culture of antebellum America. Porter's foundations can be found in the American Enlightenment, represented by Benjamin Franklin and the books of useful knowledge that became increasingly available. For example, Franklin is well known for his almanac with its weather forecasts, household hints, and puzzles. He helped establish America's, sorry, the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia in 1743, a scholarly organization that promotes scientific inquiry. An important bust of Franklin by the French sculptor Jean-Jacques Caffieri around 1785, seen here, was given to Bowdoin College in 1835 by the Vaughan family of Hallowell, Maine. They were personal friends of Franklin's. Although Rufus Porter's family was not of the intellectual and merchant elite, Porter possessed the same sort of inquiring mind and shared the same quest for knowledge as did Franklin and New England's leading cultural figures, such as James Bowden II, for whom Bowden College was named. In 1780, James Bowden founded the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Boston's rival to the American Philosophical Society. John Prince's innovative air pump, seen here, was made in Boston around 1780 and came to Bowdoin College by 1803, where it helped teach the natural sciences, in this case, the properties of a vacuum. Prince received international acclaim for his design refinements, and this is one of America's most significant scientific instruments. You see it here in its magnificent carved mahogany case closed on the left and open for experiments on the right. With its columns and scrolled pediment, it's a conceit for a temple of learning. Americans accessed useful knowledge through books and Porter was no exception. He knew and was inspired by manuals and encyclopedias such as the Repertory of Arts and Manufactures published in London between 1794 in 1802, a copy of which survives at the Bowdoin College Library. Many different sources at Bowdoin, founded in 1794, promoted Enlightenment thought in early Maine. One page illustrates a horizontal windmill on the right, patented in 1796, and is probably a model for the one that Rufus Porter built in Portland in 1818. He mined these and other volumes when he compiled his own books, notably a select collection of valuable and curious arts and interesting experiments, which he subtitled Curious Arts. Not unlike Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanacs, Porter's small how-to volumes, quote, combined recreation with improvement in useful knowledge. With practical information, simple science experiments, they were bestsellers in their time. One page of his table of contents reveals some of the topics covered from polishing steel, engraving copper plates, decorating floors, to painting landscapes on the walls of rooms, sketches of which he included in the frontispiece of his book on the left. Porter was eight years old when his family moved from Boxford to Pleasant Mountain Gore in what is today Bridgeton, Maine. This is Moose Pond at the foot of Pleasant Mountain with the White Mountains to the Northwest. Porter received a practical education on his father's farm, which he called as, quote, beautifully variegated with woodlands, high and steep hills, grassy marshes, running brooks, and a small pond. There he seized every opportunity to, quote, acquire a practical knowledge of mechanical operations and especially such arts and sciences as are required in the introduction of useful improvements. His formal education at nearby Freiburg Academy was limited, but with headmaster Amos Cook, one of New England's most progressive educators, Porter was engaged in books, learning, and the wonders of the natural world. His neighbor was Gardner Gould. 
and Porter may have known Gould's Perpetual Almanac, printed in Portland in 1805, seen here. A handy calendar reference, it could be tacked up or framed on the wall. These prints found heavy use in their time, and this copy at the American Antiquarian Society is one of only a few copies to survive. As a young adult, Porter would create his own almanac. Porter moved by 1811 into Portland, a vibrant seaport teeming with entrepreneurs and itinerant artists seen in this plan at the Maine Historical Society. It was engraved by Abel Bowen, a Boston-based artist, and Porter would collaborate with Bowden on projects in a few years' time. In Portland, Marcus Quincy, a leading townsman and a painter, is credited as Porter's teacher, and Porter learned the trade as a practical painter of houses and boats. After the revolution, Portland experienced a major building boom with elegant commercial structures and residences. None may have stirred Porter's imagination more than the 1807 observatory, 82 foot high octagonal signal tower on the top of Munjoy Hill overlooking the harbor. From this marvel of engineering, Lemuel Moody used merchants signal flags to notify them of their returning ships. Especially proud of his fine telescope made by the Dolans, the British optical instrument makers, Moody welcomed visitors whose climb to the cupola was rewarded by views of Casco Bay and the White Mountains with majestic Mount Washington, 70 miles to the west. Charles Codman's 1829 painting, Entertainment of the Boston Rifle Rangers at the Brooklyn Museum, celebrated a militia encampment on Munjoy Hill's parade ground. This scene with Casco Bay and its islands would inspire Porter's landscape murals in the years ahead. Notably, in 1811, Porter joined the Portland Light Infantry, an elite private militia company, and he signed its ledger book, now at Maine Historical. Members were expected to show up clean and prepared for regular practice. And in addition to musters on Munjoy Hill, target practice took place in Deering's Woods, today Deering Oaks. Porter served as the company's musician, a talent likely encouraged at Freiburg Academy, which was known for its music curriculum. This side drum at the Museum of Fine Arts, decorated by Charles Hubbard, is a type Porter would have played. An especially beautiful example, it features the seal of Massachusetts. During the War of 1812, Porter served in Portland's forts. This painting at Maine Historical depicts Fort Scammell on House Island in the harbor, seen from Fort Preble, today near SMCC in South Portland. Porter served at Fort Burroughs, the state fort that was located below Bunjoy Hill. One of Porter's light infantry comrades was John Hancock Hall, a brilliant mechanic and inventor who was then protect, perfecting his patent for a breech-loading rifle. You see his patent drawing here from the National Archives. Hall's efforts helped revolutionize manufacturing with interchangeable parts. He shortly moved to Harper's Ferry, Virginia to run the U.S. Armory. After the War of 1812, Porter, the polymath, began working in Portland on all three, in all three areas for which he would become known, art, invention, and publishing. He compiled a music book of militia tunes, found investors for his horizontal windmill, and turned to painting miniature portraits as a way to generate income. With his facility and knowledge of painting, Porter may have been inspired to take up miniature profiles by the many itinerant artists who traveled through Portland. The earliest known miniatures attributed to him were painted of people he knew personally. For example, Benjamin, Benjamin Lane served with Porter in the light infantry and portraits of him and his wife, Hannah, in a private collection survive in their original wooden frames believed to have been made and decorated by Porter. 
Thomas Long was a musician. His portraits at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, and he's seen here with his sister Betsy and her portraits at the Rufus Porter Museum, and it was great to um, reunite them um, in the catalog and the exhibition. They follow the period convention of men facing to the left and women facing to the right, so a pair will face each other when seen together. The sixth documented main sitter is Jacob Davis in the Carolick Collection at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. He was another of Porter's militia comrades. He's seen here with Porter's early, early advertising broadside with the cost of different types of portraits. Porter's final documented activity in Portland was the construction of a horizontal windmill on Congress Street near the intersection of what is today Forest Avenue. At the top of Portland's spine, it was historically a very windy place. And horizontal described the sails supported on a beam parallel to the ground, which you see in this patent drawing. Porter, with the support of merchant Bradbury, formed a small stock company to raise capital, and it was built in the summer of 1818. Its novelty and efficiency were praised, and notices for it appear in newspapers nationwide. Sadly, it was damaged in a gale, and Porter lamented that he could neither sell, um, nor sell it, nor any of its parts. And shortly thereafter, he returned to Massachusetts, seeking greater pastures in greater Boston. In 1820, by the time of the US Census, Porter was in Cambridge, taking advantage of increased opportunities and an expanded market for his itinerant painting. Abel Bowen, the Boston engraver and publisher, emerged as a central figure to Porter's activities. Bowen's uncle Daniel ran the Columbian Museum in Boston, where Abel created advertising broadsides, seen here. The Columbian Museum was a hub of curiosities, 20,000 of them, polar bears, among other fascinations, inventions, exhibitions of paintings, and artists plying a brisk trade. From 1821 to 1840, Porter was based in Billerica, Massachusetts, north of Boston, seen in this watercolor of the Middlesex Canal Mill Pond that's owned by the Billerica Historical Society. The Middlesex Canal, built between 1793 and 1803, was hailed, hailed as, quote, the greatest work of its kind that has been completed in the United States. The 27 mile long waterway connected the Merrimack River at Lowell with Boston Harbor. Water power and access combined with technology and innovation transformed the agrarian communities along its routes into industrial towns. The canal helped secure Boston's position as New England's commercial center. Engineering used for its construction made the Erie Canal, built 17, uh, sorry, 1817 to 1825, made it possible. Porter's home was surrounded by innovation and activity, but he was usually on the road as an itinerant painter, a peddler of books and broadsides, in settings that brought new people and experiences to him and with whom he shared ideas. Abel Bowen and his brother Henry, a printer, helped Porter realize his next works, including his revolving almanac, illustrated by this copy from the Maine State Museum. Out of thousands Porter is believed to have made, fewer than a dozen are known to survive. This calendar provided a ready reference of past and future days of the year, phases of the moon, with just the turn of the paper wheel, called a revolver, and it, the edges of the, of the um, disc are visible on the sides of the frame. A window in the center revealed a horse laboring in the fields during the seasons of the year. Porter's revolving almanac is considered one of America's earliest and most sophisticated wheel charts, and an innovative example of paper engineering 
It was created with imagination, skill, and a wonderful sense of humor. Porter expanded his miniature painting business in metropolitan Boston, and he used a camera obscura to speed his work and increase his accuracy. Consisting of an adjustable lens mounted on a hooded box, a mirror reflected the sitter's likeness onto a surface that could be traced. The camera on the left at the George Eastman Museum dates to, the, to Porter's years of work, but Porter likely made his own and with it, his technique and his quality advanced quickly. By the 1830s, he had honed his skills when he took the portraits of the Flagg family of Andover, Massachusetts, and his likenesses of children are especially charming. A book publisher, Timothy Flagg knew and had access to quality paper. Tra uh, painted on English stock bearing the Turnbull watermark on the right, the fine paper contributes to the portrait's quality and their, and their state of preservation. In addition to the revolving almanac, Abel Bowen also helped Porter with his 1825 publication called A Select Collection of Valuable and Curious Arts. As a student of the Enlightenment, Porter understood the importance of making information accessible and synthesized his interest in arts and science instruction. The ultimate do-it-yourselfers manual, it focused on practical knowledge of materials and their application, including a discussion of minerals, the mixing of paints, grain painting, and other decorative treatments. Immensely popular, it saw five editions in two years. One of the most fascinating aspects of Porter is that as a spatial thinker, he worked in scales large and small. He could shift easily from flat four inch miniatures to murals designed for three dimensional interior spaces. And he worked across disciplines. While pursuing itinerant painting, he also developed an invention shop where talented young mechanics could be trained. Here are a few extant examples of his mechanical inventions. In 1826, he developed a revolving rifle with Joseph Center in Boston possibly inspired by John Hancock Hall. Porter sold the model and the idea to Samuel Colt, who was working on a similar mechanism, and Colt made the Colt revolver a household name. Porter's rifle model survives in the Colt collection at the Wasworth Athenaeum in Hartford. Porter tinkered with all sorts of clockworks in the 1830s, and one was incorporated into this tall clock in a private collection. The dial is inscribed Rufus Porter Bill Ricca. And his sensitive fire alarm of 1840, another clockwork device, is known by this rare patent model that survives at the Hagley Museum in Wilmington. Usually short on cash, Porter was always looking for ways to generate income. Beginning in 1822, he took up landscape painting on the walls of rooms, as he called it in Curious Arts. His mural painting proved to be the most challenging of Porter topics to research. This is because a misunderstanding of the nature of, of his itinerancy and his painting techniques led to overattribution of his work during the 20th century. But by going back to the earliest sources about his work, and following a clear and logical path, we've been able to establish a new basis for understanding Porter's panoramas, seen here in his signed and dated 1838 cycle from the Howe House in West Dedham, now Westwood, Massachusetts. The bay scene with the Victory, a known steamboat, is one of Porter's finest, if not one of America's best 19th century mural paintings to survive. Porter's own extensive descriptions of his mural painting from his Art of Painting series in Scientific American and the scholarly work of Louise Carr and Edward Allen from 1926 proved, excuse me, proved invaluable in identifying the nature of his work. Interior murals are subject to changing tastes of homeowners and some of the best recorded examples no longer survive and others have been removed from their original locations, but they're saved in the process. 
But where did Porter come up with the idea to paint landscapes on walls? Decorative wall painting is an ancient European tradition from the days of Pompeii. In colonial New England, artists decorated interiors with landscapes, but they usually were limited to painting on wood panels, such as fireplace overmantels. In rare cases, such as the McPhadris Warner House in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, seen here, the staircase walls were fully painted and featured oversized figures of known Native Americans, painted around 1720. However, by the early 19th century, panoramas, continuous scenes without repetition, were decorating merchant class houses in the form of scenic wallpapers, block printed in vibrant colors and imported from France. An especially fine example by Joseph Dufour, printed in Paris around 1805, depicts Captain Cook's voyages to the Pacific. These elegant paint papers decorated the rural Williams house in Augusta, Maine, seen in the lower right. They came to the Williamses, a gift from James Bowden III, who was living in Paris and sent them directly from the manufacturers. When, when the rural Williams house was demolished, the Captain Cook papers were saved and they've been reinstalled in a house at historic Deerfield. Michele Felice Cornet, seen in his self-portrait, a lively gentleman and a decorative painter in Massachusetts, he was known for painted murals. In 1810, he created some of America's finest interior panoramas for Sullivan Door, the China trade merchant in Providence, Rhode Island, whose parlor is seen on the right. Cornet's large mural in the parlor depicts the Bay of Naples with Mount Vesuvius in the background, ships and sloops ply the harbor and people visit the shore. Among the costliest of interior decorations in a parlor full of mahogany furniture, a cut glass chandelier and wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, Cornet's painted murals were beyond the means of regular working class Americans. But did Cornet inspire Porter to add landscape mural painting to his repertoire? Abel Bowen is believed to have introduced Porter to Cornet when Cornet was living in Boston and Porter first moved to the area. Cornet had created a series of oil paintings depicting engagements of US and British ships during the War of 1812. And you see one of his oil paintings on the right. Bowen converted 21 of these paintings into small woodblock prints for his ambitious book called The Naval Monument, published in 1816. And one of the prints is on the left. In 1822, Porter traveled to Providence, where he advertised his mural painting in one of his rare newspaper notices, created landscape scenery at a local hotel, and sought clients in that flourishing port where Cornet's murals were located. He promoted his prices as, quote, less than the ordinary expense of papering. Who wouldn't want to spend the gloomy winter amidst his pleasant groves and verdant fields, as Porter asked in his ad? Notably, the murals of Cornet and Porter share panoramic qualities and iconography visible in the bay and harbor with the towers, ships, and distant mountains compared here. And it's also seen in the rocky cliffs and arching trees. But Porter wasn't interested in Cornet's old world, but in the American landscape, which he adored and his sense of humor often comes through, here with the hikers, foxes, and goats perched in the mountains, just visible at the top on the right, and then it's also on our book jacket. At the Howe House, the second floor hall features an idyllic farm seen in an historic view when the murals were still in place and a colorful detail. Porter wrote that no scenery in the world presents a more gay and lively appearance than an American farm on a swell of land with various colored fields. 
he painted what he believed. Porter priced his work for his middle-class clientele, not for wealthy merchants like Dorr. And this is what distinguishes Porter in his pursuits. He was a man focused on providing for and inspiring people of his own socioeconomic sphere. Porter's few known signed murals and the best attributed examples are found within 30 miles of his home in Bilreka and were commissioned by blacksmiths, tanners, tavern keepers, and doctors. Porter promoted mural painting in his curious arts, inspiring other itinerant artists. Panoramic landscapes of this type, known as the Porter School, are found in vernacular houses throughout New England. But who painted them? One of the best documented followers of Porter is Jonathan Poor, Porter's nephew. Poor trained with Porter and likely worked alongside him before setting out on his own. Examples of Poor's murals survive in Maine, and here are murals painted in 1840 in watercolor on plaster from the Norton House in East Baldwin, near where Porter lived and now in the collection of the Rufus Porter Museum. Like Porter, Poor created delightful scenes of island bays and towers and sailing ships and sloops, farmsteads with orchards but he wasn't Rufus Porter and his perspectives aren't as accurate as, as Porter's were. Fortunately, Porter's work has been documented by Jane Radcliffe and research by scholars is advancing a better understanding of the other itinerant artists and their work in New England. As, a, as talented a painter as Porter was, his passion was for invention, and his quest to develop mechanized flight be, be, beginning, began in the 1830s, and it's illustrated here by his earliest published image of his traveling balloon. By 1840, Porter had abandoned painting and relocated to New York to pursue mechanical improvements. But he wasn't there long before he seized the opportunity to promote useful knowledge, this time through the weekly press. As a New York City editor and publisher, Porter had a clear voice on the national stage. His most lasting legacy in this field is a Scientific American founded in 1845 and celebrating its 175th anniversary this year. Porter is noted for his innovative editorial style and he produced large illustrations of new inventions on the front page of every issue. Here is Porter's design for an elevated railway for New York, an idea that was realized 22 years later by others when the 9th Avenue L was built in 1868. He helped readers understand how the US Patent Office worked and he promoted an enormous range of new inventions. And with his style of journalism, Porter engaged his readers with compelling content content and humorous typography. The Porter soon sold Scientific American and turned his attention full time to pursuing his traveling balloon. To raise money, he founded a joint stock company. And here's one of the certificates of the aerial navigation company uh, that was owned by uh, William Marco, one of his most loyal investors that's now at the Minnesota Historical Society. Porter's quixotic quest captured the attention of Americans, and he suffered a healthy dose of ridicule, often directed at people with unconventional ideas. During the national craze to reach Western gold mines, Porter promoted his ship as the quickest way to California, three days from New York. Courier and Ives included Porter's traveling balloon in their satir satirical print called The Way They Go to California, and he's seen in the upper left. And they paired him with the character of Mr. Golightly, a silly man astride a rocket ship, seen in the upper, upper right. When Winslow Homer's father left home to seek his fortune in California, the young artist created his own version of Mr. Golightly in this drawing at the top 
from the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Porter's airport was nearly complete when he suffered a series of misfortunes, including ice storms, weather damage, and vandalism. Porter wasn't a good supervisor, and he wasn't a good businessman. And with his qualities of an empresario, he didn't instill confidence in people. When the aerial navigation company ran out of money, he had to give up his quest. And although he did not complete his airship, his experiments in aerodynamics and the structural integrity needed for such an advan a vessel advanced the field. Porter did not become one of Christian Schuschel's men of progress, seen in their magnificent portrait at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. Men including Samuel Colt and Samuel F. B. Morris who converted their inventions into successful businesses and earned great fortunes, making them a new type of American hero. But what Rufus Porter did do was actively participate in America's transformation from an agrarian republic to a connected, participatory, and technological democracy. And he brought Americans along with him. His influence as an educator through his books and newspapers cannot be underestimated. And through his diverse endeavors in painting, invention, and communication, this remarkable polymath helped democratize art and invention in early America. Thank you. <laughs> Laura, thank you very much. That, that was wonderful. And um, I want to invite those of you on the call, if, if you have a question for Laura, if you can type it into the um, chat to everyone, um, that would be excellent. And um, we did have an early question about um, the word polymath. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little more about what a is a polymath? A polymath is a person who can do a lot of different things and can think, they can think in, you know, three dimensions. They're, they're not, cons you know, constrained by words or um, uh, uh, they, they, they could just think in, in, in many different ways. And, and that's, what, that's what made um, Porter as um, sort of technologically fueled his uh, abilities. Does that help? Yes, that, uh, that helps a lot. Um, a question about failure. Mm -hmm. Some people, some other inventors went on to be successful with ideas that Rufus Porter may have had first. Mm -hmm. uh, because he was such a good writer, and it, he was a journalist himself, are there, is there any writing that indicates how he, he might have felt when one of, one of his ideas was turned into a profitable business by another inventor? Well, that, that's an interesting question because it, um, we, it, we finally figured out that because there isn't a lot written, the only, yeah. the only, the best, the best letters that do survive were the letters that, uh, the, the correspondence between Porter and William Marco about the area port that, that survive at the Minnesota Historical Society. And Marco loved this idea and he was sure that Porter was going to get it off the ground. But Porter, you know, he had well, like, what about the numbers on those stock certificates? Do you really have 500 investors? And like, why haven't you gotten farther along? And, and Porter just was never able to like manage the business. And, and I think that he, and he had so many ideas that he would stop with one thing, say, I'm done with that. I'm moving on to the next thing. So selling the revolving rifle idea to Colt, it wasn't a big deal. He was working on something else. 
and 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 Colt was also working on the same. I mean, they're wonderful little models at Wasworth Athenaeum of these wooden revolving mechanisms. Colt's just buying them out because he doesn't want to end up in a patent suit. So he's taking advantage of a situation that Porter doesn't really care about it. He's on to the next thing. Um, and I think that I think that th that was one of that was one of the um, one of the hardest things about um, you know getting to the sense of how did Porter feel when he failed because he failed a lot and and what is failure really I mean he failed at those businesses he didn't get his airship off the ground but he was able to do s so many other things that promoted um, invention and in art in, in early America. Yes. We have another question. Uh, did Rufus Porter have students or associates who traveled with him to do the murals or was he a solo performer? Well, we know that we're pretty sure that he, that Jonathan Poor traveled with him for, for, for a while. Um, we, we did learn from the Ariel Reporter's little autobiographical piece that Porter says he only practiced mural painting in the summertime when the weather was good. Um, and his, you know, his best documented murals are within 30 miles of where he lived. So he's not, he's not going really far afield. But, but otherwise we don't, we, oh yeah, his son. Yeah, sorry. His son, Stephen. Um, his oldest son painted with him until he died in 1850, um, 1840. It was right after, right, right before Porter gives up painting and then goes on to New York. But those are the only two people we know about. And certainly Stephen Twombly Porter, his oldest son, worked longer with him than anybody else. Interesting. And in terms of surprises, when you and Justin were working for four years on on this project, there were there were some surprises or some discoveries. What what's your favorite? Oh boy, um, I think one of the things was finding finding the um, the miniatures that were painted in Maine. So they were his earliest works. They, they are pretty rough when you compare them to what he did 10 years later with a camera obscura and a lot of practice. But it was really, it was really fun to find, you know, three there and then two there and then one there. And then we finally identified the, the um, Jacob Davis at the, at the Carolick collection at the Museum of Fine Arts. And, and the thing that was fun about those is that every one of those pieces of paper have the same red ink on the backs of them, which meant that the paper started out as a big sheet used for some other purpose that then Porter cut down. And so those miniatures were all made pretty much at the same time, probably in Portland, but you know maybe between Portland and Lewiston because that's where those other folks lived. Um, but it was, there were, there, were, there were fun things to just, you know, being able to learn more about his correspondence with Marco. We discovered one of Marco's descendants um, who lives in Minnesota, who shared more material with us. Um, so they were all along the way, good discoveries. The, the illustration that you showed of, uh, that was done by Winslow Homer mm -hmm. as a child, how, how did you find that? at the MFA? Um, I, I can't remember now how I stumbled on it, except that there had been a little article published, I think in one of the museum's newsletters by Sue Reed, who was the curator of the Princeton Drawings Room at the MFA. And when I, when I found that, I, that was pretty exciting because I knew who Mr. Golightly was and to find Winslow Homer creating his own version. Um, it was pretty fun. Do you know how old he was when um, he? Let's see. I think he was born in eighteen thirty. I think he was. He was nine or ten. Is nine or ten, and his father did not make a fortune 
in the California gold fields. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, are there any other questions for Laura? Looking to see if anybody. Unmute. This is Steve Mead. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> um, a couple of things. I would, um, and I've actually kind of read the, um, the book. It's on my bedside table. Good. And Laura, I just, you know, I, I love this stuff. But um, one of the things I thought was really curious is that everybody has to make money in the mm -hmm. course of their career, i.e. they got to put food on the table. And I think it's really interesting. Rufus always kind of kept coming back to the art because he could, he could make a buck, you know, right. from it. Though the other stuff that he did is actually much more at a higher level and commendable. And I was, um, I was struck by the fact that the connection between, um, and it's like the connection between artists and architects. You have to have a certain artistic ability to be an inventor in the first place. And he clearly had that connection sort of inventor and artist. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering in terms of um, any kind of evidence that he looked back on people like um, Da Vinci or other people that not only were artists in history, but also thinkers about how to make things work. And so that's, that's the first question. And then I got a follow on question. Okay. Well, the first question is, we don't, we don't know, we, we don't have a list of the books that he read. But, with, but Freiburg Academy had one of the finest school libraries in Maine at the time. And, and, they, and the, you know, the, the chances of the repertory of arts and manufacturers and the domestic encyclopedias and these huge multi-volume books that told you how to do all these things were available to Porter is, is pretty high. Yeah. And, and you know, he, could, he could have known about Da Vinci by reading about him but i don't know i i we don't really have any evidence what he thought about you know could he do these things too that da vinci had come up with we don't right know. right and then the other follow-up question was i i was struck by his almanacs and i think i read that ben franklin you know did a lot with almanac yep, in terms of publishing and these things were real money makers in terms of you know a source of income so if you were somebody who was dabbling in a lot of things, I mean, Franklin had a, you know, he, had, he actually had, what do they call those things? Um, you know, and, and, and Franklin never really made much money from his quote, invention endeavors or whatever, and his, his scientific work, but it didn't stop him. But right. I think he made a fair amount of money from almanacs. And I was wondering why, Rufus didn't sort of pursue the almanac side a little bit more um, or not, you know, kind of thing. The, well, the revolving almanac, he did pretty well with that. I mean, there are enough yeah. Yeah. surviving copies. But once again, that's an example where, you know, he just moved on to something else. Yeah. On one hand, it made some money, but then on the other hand, the, the, the pull to do something new was was too great. Right, right, right. No, no, no. It just... Um, well, he's a tough subject because if we had more letters like his poor wife, like, like her letters don't survive, but she must have had a tough time trying to raise eight, kids, nine kids. Yeah, yeah, on, yeah. On, and on then, then there's the issue of, you know, in terms of from a financial standpoint, what did the Scientific American mean for him, you know, while he was alive? What did it mean of, for him? Yeah, in terms of just sort of financial impact. And I, I just think that that is an extraordinary sort of effort on his part. Um, well, well, it was. And he did, and he actually did quite well with that newspaper. Um, unfortunately, not long after he had gotten it going, his oh, building burned and he didn't have insurance and so he lost like seven hundred dollars worth of his investment all the plates you know is, is i think he got away with his subscription list 
Um, but he was always um, trying to get more subscribers. Um, that, that comes through pretty clearly in his editorials and his newspapers. But I think he was quite proud of his newspaper publishing career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> one, one last question for you, Laura, about the, the future of learning about uh, Rufus Porter's work. What do you think will happen next as, as people explore his murals and other pursuits? Well, there's, there's a group um, that's focused on murals and mural preservation um, that's based in Hallowell called the Center for Painted Wall Preservation. And they've, um, they've actually got a symposium organized, digital um, uh, program later in October. And there, it's a good group that's looking at like, identifying where murals still survive, who painted them. And they range from like early murals to the wall paintings at Victoria Mansion, which are, you know, um, 20 years later. Um, but that, but, but spending, um, looking more carefully at itinerant artists in America who were following Porter, um, it, it would be great to, to make some more headway there. And, and then I don't, I mean, we do know that Porter sort of retired in quotes to the, um, um, to Connecticut, I think in the, along the Naugatuck River where there was all sorts of um, manufacturing going on. And he was tinkering and, and a few letters that survived from that period talk about how involved he was in these small little spring companies and latch companies um, and, and maybe going through Connecticut and um, trying to identify um, what he was doing there would be of interest, but I don't, but he didn't have the national voice that he did earlier in his career, which is why we focused on the years we did. Wonderful. Well, we have um, a question about um, if there's a way for someone to watch uh, tonight's presentation and uh, it, we are recording. And so uh, we hope to have a recording that we'll be able to share with participants tonight and share with people who were unable to be with us and we'll share it on the Scarborough Public Library website as well. So if any of you have um, a, a friend or a relative who's interested in, in Rufus Porter and his work, um, we'll, we'll be able to, to um, let them see this too. Um, so it's getting close to 7.30 or it is 7.30 and if we were all here at the library at this point we would encourage people to chat with you informally Laura and you could sign your book. Um, we can't do that in the, in, in the virtual world um, but we can um, encourage people to look at the catalog. It's really terrific. Um, I've had a chance to, to um, look at it quite a bit. And um, on behalf of the Scarborough Library, I want to thank you very much for giving your illustrated talk tonight. And thanks to everybody for coming. Thank you. Take care. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.